Welcome back to the world of Eichard, where we learn how to think like the College Board. Today we're covering topics 7.2 and 7.3. Here's the required content for 7.2, Causes of World War I. On June 28, 1914, Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. One month later, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Within two days, the Russian Empire mobilized troops to fight Austria-Hungary. Two days after that, Germany declared war on Russia, and then on France two days after that, and then invaded Belgium the next day, causing the British to declare war on Germany. Less than three weeks later, Japan declared war on Germany. Then less than two months after that, the Ottoman Empire allied with Germany and Austria-Hungary in war against the rest. How did it escalate so quickly? I know, Maine. Militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Yes, we often like to use this acronym. Let's start with nationalism. Firstly, ethnic nationalism in the Balkan Peninsula. After the Balkan Wars, Serbia emerged as an important regional power and came in direct rivalry with Austria-Hungary. Here's a map of the many different ethnicities in Austria-Hungary in the early 20th century, and you can see how ethnic nationalism would have been problematic for them. But they continued expanding eastward, even officially annexing Bosnia in 1908, which angered the Serbians, who wanted to incorporate all the Slavs into their own ethnic nation-state, and the Russians, who also identified as Slavic, supported Serbia. This is the most direct example of what the College Board describes as regional and territorial conflicts as a major cause of World War I. In addition to ethnic nationalism, we also need to talk about intensified nationalism in general in this time period. By 1914, Europe was divided into competing nation-states. War was, in many ways, the ultimate nationalistic competition. It demonstrated the nation's national vitality, the strength of its industrial capacity, the bravery and sacrifice of its people. War against other nations could also unite the people and distract them from the bitter class divisions that we saw develop in Topic 5.9. And you should recall from Topic 5.2 how leaders use nationalism to foster a sense of unity. Now militarism. Militarism isn't actually listed by the College Board as a separate cause, because it's better to think of it as a subcategory of nationalism. As nationalism intensified, many leaders and citizens of these nations were actually looking forward to the opportunity to prove their national strength in a war with their rivals. Military imagery and language became used more frequently, as seen in the leaders of all these nations who were constantly cosplaying as soldiers, decorating themselves with military medals and regalia. Military budgets of the European nations like Britain, France, and Germany had grown by around 300% since the 1870s, which they used to fund large standing armies and and invest in ever more advanced military technology. In addition to building up their militaries, the European powers were also secretly developing elaborate war plans for how to use them. Most famous was the German Schlieffen Plan, which anticipated correctly a war on two fronts with both France and Russia, and required a rapid mobilization to attack France first. Since these plans required quick action to go according to schedule, it left little to no time for diplomatic attempts to prevent conflict. Intensified nationalism, increased armaments, and war plans plans all incentivized aggression. Now the flawed alliance system. This was the most direct reason why a regional conflict escalated to involve all of the great powers. By 1914, the great powers were sorted in a complex web of alliances. The Triple Alliance included Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, and the Triple Entente included Britain, France, and Russia. But there were also separate alliances, like that between Russia and Serbia. These alliances often stipulated that if one nation went to war, its ally would join them. Confusingly, the Triple Alliance eventually became the Central Powers and the Triple Entente became the Allied Powers. So Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia because of the assassination. And Russia is going to fight Austria-Hungary to help its ally Serbia. And because Germany is allied with Austria-Hungary, they declare war on Russia. And since the French are allied with the Russians, that means they'll have to fight the Germans. But the Germans declare war on France first because of the Schlieffen Plan. And because of the Triple Entente, the British get involved. No, the British got involved because the Germans invaded Belgium. Why'd the Germans invade Belgium? Because it's on the way to France. It's the Schlieffen Plan. Now imperialism, specifically imperial expansion. This is the reason why the war escalated out of Europe to become a truly global conflict. As we recall from Unit 6, European nations had amassed substantial overseas empires in Africa and Asia. When the war broke out, almost instantly British and French forces invaded Germany's African colonies. And the Japanese, who were allied with the British, took the opportunity to invade German possessions in China and the Pacific. The desire to get ever more territory was 
was another incentive for the imperialists to get into conflict. Also, the Ottoman Empire joined the war on the side of Germany partially because it had lost territory to Britain, France, and Italy as a result of imperial expansion of those nations in earlier decades. Now let's talk about the war itself. Here's the required content for 7.3, conducting World War I. Let's start with military technology, which made the war especially deadly. This is connected to industrialization, since the great powers involved in the war were able to produce weapons at an unprecedented scale. An estimated 1 billion artillery shells were used in the conflict, and several billion bullets. Several hundred thousand miles of barbed wire was also used to prevent enemy advances, which, combined with trenches, artillery, and machine gun fire, created a killing zone called No Man's Land, where waves of soldiers were annihilated before even reaching their enemy. Industrialization also allowed for new innovations that radically changed the nature of warfare. Poison gases and flamethrowers added new horrors. On the sea, submarines were used extensively for the first time. Their ability to launch torpedoes below the surface added unseen dangers to ships, including civilian vessels. And for the first time, the skies became a battleground, with the use of the first military aircraft, like airplanes and zeppelins. The first tanks made their debut in the Battle of the Somme. Much of this military tech, like planes and tanks, would have a much bigger impact on the Second World War than the first. But the industrial scale and weapons caused an industrial scale of death. Over 10 million soldiers died, and many more were wounded. Now this, World War I was the first total war. Historian Stieg Furster identified four main categories of total war, which we can use to understand the rest of what's required in 7.3. First, total purposes. Many of the previous European conflicts had limited aims, but as World War I dragged on, the goal increasingly became the complete devastation of the enemy, making them unable to ever be a threat again. This can be seen in the terms of the Treaty of Versailles of 1915, 19, the main treaty ending the war in Europe. Germany was forced to accept terms that not only took away territory, but drastically reduced its military. It was also obliged to pay astronomical reparations to its former enemies, an amount that would surely devastate the German economy. In fact, this was the whole point, to forever weaken Germany so that it would never again pose a threat to world peace. Seems like that didn't work out so well. Second is total methods. The nations involved used every available method, including poison gas, which had already been declared illegal in previous decades. Also, civilians became seen as acceptable targets, with German zeppelins conducting air raids in Britain and German submarines attacking non-military ships. British ships enforced the Allied blockade of Germany, cutting the country off from all sea trade, including in basic necessities like food and medicine. Governments also employed mass propaganda and art as a method for the war effort. Propaganda posters were printed throughout the various nations involved in the war. Often the enemy was depicted in a dehumanizing way, making them seem barbaric, vicious, and cruel, with their own soldiers and citizens depicted as heroic and patriotic. This also went along with intensified nationalism, which was harnessed by governments to create an us-versus-them mentality, and to justify the increasing carnage as a necessary and moral sacrifice for the nation. So Mr. Eichard, are you saying that nationalism was a major cause of the war, but also that the war caused caused even more nationalism? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Now, total mobilization. In addition to the nationalist propaganda encouraging men to enlist in the military, there was also the practice of conscription, compelling them to join whether they wanted to or not. Total war wasn't just about mobilizing soldiers, but also about mobilizing the entire population and resources of the economy for the war effort. Governments enforced rationing of all kinds of resources, such as food, fuel, textiles, and metals. Factories needed to be converted to produce artillery shells and other supplies for the military, just at the time when all the men were being sent to the fields. So it was often women who took the jobs in the factories making weapons or uniforms, or on farms or many other types of work. And since this war was fought among the great imperialist nations of Europe, it meant that their colonies around the world also contributed heavily to the war effort. Over a million South Asian soldiers from British India fought in the war, as did tens of thousands of Africans and Vietnamese troops. In addition, the economies of these colonies were also harnessed to supply the war. The fourth category is total control. In order to enforce all the other aspects of total war we mentioned, governments needed to exert ever stronger control over their populations, including intensified censorship and the crushing of political dissent. Enlightenment liberal values like freedom of speech and freedom of the press were suppressed in the interest of the nation's war efforts. Historian Tiziano Peccia added a fifth category, total change, which describes the various transformative effects of the war. Social effects included the transformation of hierarchies, such as gender. Since women's contributions to the war made them feel empowered and earned them a greater role in society. And in many countries, such as Britain, the United States, Germany, and others, 
women finally earned the right to vote shortly after the war. Cultural effects included the shattering in the myth of the idea of progress and Europeans' belief in the superiority of their own civilization. European prestige among the many colonized peoples of the world also declined substantially. Now that's all for topics 7.2 and 7.3. In our next video, we'll talk more about the long-term effects, especially economic and political. Until then, keep thinking like the College Board. Like and subscribe if you want to get a five.